<clears throat> so it, it's a real honor to be here. And, uh, there's, there's a couple of things that Rich touched upon that I'm going to get a chance to meet with the residents later on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to see touched upon this idea of uh, endoscopic surgery, which is always a, a passion of mine. As a resident, as you go through your careers, you'll see that opportunity comes your way in very unpredictable ways and manners. Um, when I came to Cornell after finishing my fellowship with sick kids, uh, I, I kind of fashioned myself as an accomplished microneurosurgeon. Um, but the need from the standpoint of evolving technologies like that uh, would mean that places like Memorial Sloan Kettering and the entire staff at Wild Cornell, I would serve as the repository for most of those referrals. And you, and you start to look at opportunity like this in, in ways that you would never predict, and that's been a phenomenal aspect of the career. Uh, one thing I love about being here <clears throat> is that this mystique of, you know, the Seattle program is, is the kind of I wouldn't say erased, but uh, revealed to me as far as the glory and what people talk about all the time when they come here. And uh, you know, we believed it enough to, to, to force Peter Morgenstern on Rich and his colleagues. Um, but it's, it's very, very enlightening when you travel and look at uh, what is told versus what you see. And I'll start off by talking about that, that interface and the kind of cross-fertilization between Cornell and the new wash has, has been interesting of late. <clears throat> um, and again, I didn't, I came in, came in this somewhat ignorantly. Um, but as I think of individuals who have migrated from New York to, to Seattle, uh, and I think this program being the beneficiary of, there's been a couple of uh, examples that I, that I would highlight. And one is when we lost Eric Holland to, to the, the Hutch, it was a, a real uh, eye-opener for me as far as, you know, what is in Seattle? Why, why, why go to the Hutch versus Memorial Sloan Kettering? And I think he's, he's worked out wonderfully here. Uh, Chris Hofstetter, he's not here, is he? Sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, again, is, you know, phenomenal from the standpoint of uh, evolving technology, and you know, I align it with a, uh, a, this thematic issue of minimally invasive neurosurgery. And again, very, very uh, proficient in the academic realm, and then of late, uh, Peter, uh, who has been phenomenal as a resident, interfacing with me on anything and everything in uh, pediatric neurosurgery. What, what intrigued me more, however, is the, the reverse direction. And it, it wasn't quite clear to me that this worked out in a very uh, beneficial fashion uh, in a unilateral, I mean, in a bilateral uh, dimension. So when uh, Dr. Ogeman Sr. trained and spent a year with uh, Ted Schwartz, came back to New York and started driving our epilepsy and our skull-based program, but this is what we got. <laughs> the same on one of our typical case conferences at 7 in the morning. Uh, probably not being interested in some pediatric neurosurgery uh, case that's being presented. Yeah, but, then, but then I gave Seattle the benefit of the doubt and said, well, maybe a more contemporary chair like Rich would send somebody who's a little bit more productive. And Rohan Ramakrishna, this is a typical day in his life. And if you can't see the detail, we hired him to kind of engage in our neuro-oncology program. That's, that's what's there sitting on his desk. So, so I don't think it's been fair, but it's been pleasant, Rich. And <laughs> thank you and Dr. Ogeman for what you bestowed upon Manhattan neurosurgery. So to get in the meat of uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, is something that, again, you, you, I like these thematic issues, and, and a lot of what I will talk about is mindset and things retrospectively you look at as you go through your career. Jonathan Finley, who was very instrumental in recruiting me to come to Memorial Sloan Kettering, left about two years after I arrived and thought, this is fantastic. My passion in neuro-oncology, international name and uh, pediatric neuro-oncology kind of uh, abandons me in, uh, in New York City. But it forces you to start thinking about ways to invent yourself and ways to, to propel the field in different ways. Uh, and DIPG and malignant gliomas of the brainstem, it's not that there were a surgical passion by any stretch. And as Harvey Christian would say, you know, it's only meant for the neurosurgeon without hands. You know, there's, there's nothing to do. Um, and this has been recognized for well over 100 years that uh, you know, from the sur surgical interface, there's, there's, there's not much to accomplish in this disease. The other thing that uh, around that era, 1997, 1998, uh, that was eye-opening to me is, uh, and I used to read a lot more than I do now, is this uh, idea of uh, <clears throat> problems in drug delivery and pediatric neuro-oncology. And one of those big obstacles was uh, one of the platforms that was you know, raving at Memorial when I got there was high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell rescue. Um, and there was, a, there was a toxic mortality rate of approaching 10% in that era. You know, one in 10 kids would die from the treatment itself, 
uh, versus the, uh, the, the disease process that we're attempting to treat. So this idea of very inefficient methods of using very biologically relevant uh, materials was a big, big problem. <clears throat> and then the other summarized by, and not new, but Kathy Warren, who's a, a real champion in pharmacokinetics and CNS and drug delivery in the oncology realm, who's done at the NCI, had summarized this of late. And you can look at these plots with regard to the amount of drug in the site that we desire it to be in relative to the plasma and the circulating system. And that's, you know, obviously that equilibrates as you push higher and higher to get a, a little bit of a greater fraction of drug within the CNS into the toxic uh, side effects that I spoke about. Um, and this is even not even looking at uh, a free unconjugated drug. This is just uh, using the standard formats for looking at drug concentrations. You can see within the, that, that last line on the bottom in yellow uh, brainstem itself, and she's also had a focus on DIPG, and we fail in getting drugs there. So that, that, was, that was fulminating as I was coming into my first staff position. I was very intrigued by this idea. And right around that time was the, uh, the Gliadel wafer craze and uh, the randomized trial that was going on with regard to local drug delivery. Conceptually, it makes great sense. You bypass, bypass the blood-brain barrier, um, didn't make much sense from the standpoint of invasive gliomas. So if something were very regional and limited based on a scale of millimeters or submillimeters, it would, it would probably have tremendous efficacy if you had the right agent. <coughs> then there was this, this other initiative uh, really coming out of uh, the NCI and NIH uh, by uh, Dr. Oldfield, the late Dr. Oldfield and his colleagues looking at bypassing this idea that you're limited by diffusion, but use a pressure gradient to drive these molecules through the interstitium. That was the, the basic premise of that. You can see the differentiation between a principle of diffusion and light gray versus something that is these convective forces, or if you want to think of it as interstitial pressure gradients, to give you a much wider distribution and a more square format or, or phase of distribution itself. <clears throat> so to me, this was very intriguing as, uh, as I started my career from an oncologic standpoint, that if we had interesting macromolecular therapy, and there's plenty of those on the on the launch pad today, and if these did get out of the bloodstream, why not go directly to interstitium? Um, and that's that's what was being championed by Dr. Oldfield and his colleagues. So whether it be viral <coughs> particles or liposomes or, or monoclonal antibodies, really became somewhat irrelevant. That if you can get these up to you know, 200 uh, micromol, I mean micro nanomolar in the uh, in the interstitium, then you, you, you have the capacity to get this through the interstitium and get your, your targeted agent in this cartoon uh, to the site of interest without, and I'll say that equivalently from the standpoint of potential benefit, without systemic exposure. That, that was the conceptual backbone of that in the late 1990s, early 2000s. <clears throat> Others jumped on this idea, uh, the group up at Columbia, Jeff Bruce and his colleagues started looking at this in uh, animal models, uh, a, a phrase they use, intracerebral crisis, same as convection enhanced delivery. Yeah, with pretty impressive, uh, very early results looking at rudimentary at the time, you know, the best we had with regard to glioma models and the cerebrum of uh, rodent models, uh, and looking at the difference between, uh, you know, either sham surgery or two different concentrations with local delivery versus systemic delivery, uh, and looking at survival assays in these, in these rodents. Um, same thing going down, uh, going on at the uh, NIH with uh, Dr. Oldfield's laboratory, um, <clears throat> and again examples of systemic delivery uh, with two different agents. This was, uh, I think, carbo and gemcitabine uh, versus uh, that with local delivery. So pretty impressive from the standpoint of evolving translational capacity. So at that time, I flew down to the NIH and, and met with. Uh, uh, Ed Oldfield in his laboratories, uh, Stuart Walbridge, I think, was the lead tech at the time. I dragged one of my residents kicking and screaming, David Sandberg, who's now at the University of Texas Houston, uh, to come into my lab and start thinking about this interface in, in, a, in a more constrained place, and that was in the brainstem. And, and a lot of reasons not to do this, right? It's a small domain. These kids have a lot of interstitial pressure gradients already, um, never been done. They've got X number of months of survival, and I'm going to subject them to something that's potentially catastrophic. But credit to Dave, he, he ran forward with this, and uh, and we were able to, uh, and I remember this very distinctly, after he lost several rats running around the, the hospital and escaped from the laboratory. Um, he was new to the lab as I was, <clears throat> but he would come back and say, these animals are doing amazing after six hours, after eight hours, after two weeks of infusions in their brainstem. 
you know, I, I couldn't believe that it was as uh, biologically viable as, as it was. So <clears throat> that was kind of the precipice for me to say, do I make a commitment to this or not? And there, I chose to do that. And that was that evolving translational landscape. And I remember after David worked in the lab, I thought this would probably be a year, year and a half, maybe two years to get this into a, uh, a launch pad from the standpoint of uh, clinical application. Uh, and I can tell you, and again, this is a, a comment to the residents more than anybody else or the junior faculty, uh, you know, if you want to be methodical, and I'm going to come back to this idea of uh, ethics and, uh, and uh, responsibility in the, in the translational world, um, it's a long, enduring process. And, uh, and we started with that paper, and uh, I, don't, I don't have them all listed here, but I want to give you a sense of the time scale as you move and you, you do another set of experiments, and that kind of begets three more that have to be done to look at things like dosimetry, to look at systemic toxicity, to look at histologic uh, compromise or lack of histologic compromise, to start looking at rodent models, to start looking at larger scale animals and primates for toxicity and two species. And this goes on and on and on, and things that I had no idea was part of this landscape in front of me. And it was, uh, it was time consuming and uh, exhausting in some ways. Then even submitting the protocol, and I had no uh, element at all of background training in investigator-initiated trials. Uh, but that was a, a process that, again, at a place like MSK, I thought would be X number of months. You submit the protocol. Neil Luther was the primary author, one of our former residents at the time, who was working in my lab for two years. Um, it, was, it was exhausting. Uh, and, and the systems have changed a little bit, and I'm going to come back to that. But the process for approval was, uh, was, was extremely detailed and uh, read by a lot of uh, individuals who had no exposure to neurosurgery or oncology for that matter. But eventually uh, activated their protocol late 2011, began treating in 2012. And I won't go through all that intervening uh, science or translation work. But this is what we had uh, at that time uh, uh, kind of designed from the standpoint of, and really this is built around, and I say it wasn't cancer therapy, this was more about safety and feasibility. Because the last thing I wanted to do was jump into something with a different platform, interventional uh, adjunct, uh, and have a child die from a catheter insertion. So, so we, we wanted to be less than ambitious about this and just really create and design and build upon the surgical infrastructure. So a one-time injection, no pre-operative or no pre-therapeutic uh, uh, biopsy was being done. Uh, no systemic, I mean, no uh, um, co-administration of gadolinium. Everything that we could do to reel back on potential toxicity is the way I'd, I had designed this, as much as we wanted to be 10 steps forward. Um, and, and in short, uh, once the, again, no pre-diagnostic uh, biopsy, they didn't need that for, for study, study eligibility. One of the critiques, my own critiques about the, uh, the process. Um, but if they did qualify, they'd get a single injection of this, this isotope that I'll talk about. Um, and then there was a heavy emphasis on the imaging. Uh, this I didn't appreciate at the time, but the, the emphasis was really built around dosimetry. For me, it was about response, but as I spent the next uh, 10 years of my career speaking with our nuclear medicine specialist, this was the real horsepower behind this and the real, I think, value added compared to what we had known before this. And, and Russ Lonzer and, uh, and, and Kathy Warren, uh, they just published their results with IL-13. But they had a very rudimentary experience, and I think two patients with brain stem tumors that they had injected a IL-13 molecule into. Uh, but we wanted to look at this in a very systemic, uh, systematic, excuse me, dose escalating format. We really knew nothing, and, and certainly the platform with local drug delivery, there was no gauge as far as infusion rates, volumes that would be tolerant, different anatomical domains, what agents were safe, which ones weren't. It was just kind of a mess and amalgamation of people, and I don't want to use the phrase that was used by Stuart Walbridge, but squirting something in the brain and hoping it worked without a lot of thought about uh, building upon this platform in a very thoughtful way. I, I, I highlight this just before I get into the, the results, just because, and it didn't occur to me at the time, we were really going down this idea of a conjugated immunotoxin, and Ira Paston, who's down at the NCI, is one of the world's leaders in conjugated toxins that we were partnering with and doing a lot of preclinical work and toxicity analysis <coughs> studies with. And we were fully engaged to do this, uh, but we, we stopped because of the estimation of uh, another two year worth of commitment and maybe uh, two to three million dollars in investment to get a new IND for that agent. Um, uh, but at the time, concurrently, again, this idea of opportunity at Memorial, they were injecting this 
monoclonal antibody conjugated to an isotope in kids with relapsed CNS neuroblastoma, another neuroectodermally derived tumor, with really impressive results from the standpoint of changing the uh, universal fatal outcome of these kids to, to impressive survival results as an adjunct injected into the intrathecal compartment. So a pre-existing IND for the molecule in children, in the brain, a different compartment, uh, and this made it exceptionally easier to, to look at this, uh, uh, or just uh, um, uh, sign on to this IND and get it uh, implemented into this therapeutic trial, and that helped immensely. And as the, the science evolved over the past several years of using this, there's been a lot of recent uh, evidence looking at this as something that uh, we had hoped from the standpoint of the monoclonal antibody component of this, and that's uh, this uh, idea that it's a, a checkpoint inhibitor as well. So it's built upon this uh, murine-based monoclonal with this uh, conjugated isotope. And I don't know if there's, there's probably nobody with a passion for nuclear medicine in here, but I-124 equivalent is biological activity to I-131, but better for the dose symmetry part of this. That's what we really wanted uh, from the standpoint of what we were doing and how well we were doing with it. So five, six years worth of uh, study uh, uh, enrollment, and uh, we just published our results in November of last year. And we really, it was the first time we looked at this in a dose escalating, volume escalating format, utilizing something that we had very reproducible dosimetry on. So this conceptual idea, can you get something into your target in high concentrations and avoid the systemic circulation? The, uh, the, the undisputable result of that was yes, or response to that. We still have yet to reach what's called a, a maximal tolerated dose. I, I use a little bit of caution there from the standpoint of radiobiology, volumetric issues. So we're, we're changing a lot of those variables as we move forward um, and still have not seen any uh, grade four or five uh, uh, SAEs to limit our dose, uh, our dose escalation platform. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think the most impressive yield that came from this, the result that came from this, was this validation of direct drug delivery and that you can get agents with no systemic exposure, no systemic toxicity, and a very quantifiable measure, and that's utilizing the PET scan with our isotope. And essentially, this is the inverse of what you'd get with systemic uh, circulation administration. So on average, between nine and 1,200 times greater than in, in any other body compartment is based on the measurements with PET scanning, which to me, and I think our, our radiobiologists who sit there and listen to this at our monthly meetings are just kind of sitting there with their, their, their mouth gasping, saying, why don't we do this all the time? It makes no sense why we wouldn't be using this as a platform. And then the other, in our, in our volume escalation uh, component of this, we're starting to reach volumes of distribution, and that means where our agent is going anatomically, and something that starts to now mirror uh, the burden or the volume of most of these tumors after radiation therapy is, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little more detail. So. Uh, here, here is a crucial point in, in, in my decision making. Do, do we move this forward or not? There's five years worth of data, lots of dosimetry, uh, safety elements have been phenomenal. Um, we haven't hurt anybody in the process. If you invest another five, ten years, and another three to four million dollars, we're going into the element of <coughs> sure clinical effectiveness. And, and that's where I'm going to spend the next uh, half hour getting into some of the the things that keep me awake and, and I struggle with because, again, there's, there's, there's little reference to fall back on here. As you go through your career and something that's kind of exploratory, you know, who do I talk to? You know, I talk to our functional neurosurgeons, Chris Bankowitz at UCSF, Russ Lonser at uh, Ohio State. You know, these are individuals that have a dappling in this and maybe different applications, different goals, different anatomical targets, but, but the, the world becomes very small from the standpoint of learning from our colleagues. Um, and, and Peter was instrumental in looking at some of our technical issues. Um, I'm still after him to publish more of those that are hopefully uh, forthcoming. But, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, I was not trained as a functional neurosurgeon, and I put catheters in the ventricle all the time without knowing where those catheters are going with great confidence. Yeah, but now here we are in a phase one study with uh, the FDA <coughs> looking over our shoulder with uh, a responsibility report in a, in a very, very de detailed manner. You know, I, I spoke with our functional neurosurgeon at Cornell, Mike Caplet, uh, as far as you know, when, when you put in DBS, what does one need to look at? What anatomical domains are you are you limited by? Um, and this was very telling to me. You know, we're going nine, ten centimeters down from the cortical surface. And I remember looking at some of these trajectories as they passed near the cruel cistern with you know millimeters of, of, of uh, cushion, uh, being somewhat unnerved about it. Um, and uh, again, the platform we use, not to go into too much detail, is the 
intra intra intraoperative MR with the clear point uh, system, so we can do essentially real time imaging at any frequency we want to look at our catheter tip with with millimeter scaling. And I, and I still to this day in these early phase clinical studies, as using this as an application for this particular disease, think it's a mandate. You know, we don't want to have you know, literally blood on our hands from the standpoint of something that could have been done better, and there's no room for, I think, uh, imprecision here. The other interesting thing is we would pass these catheters, and in, in my conversations with Dr. Kaplan, you got to avoid the capsule, got to involve the red nucleus, got to involve the cruel. This went on and on. Uh, constraints wouldn't allow us always to do that. And what always surprised me is how well these kids looked passing these catheters directly through the post care limit the capsule or the genu. Um, and Peter looked at this from the standpoint of uh, then going back and retrospectively looking at our MR uh, tractography, uh, looking at points of convergence, length of uh, intersection, uh, and really because we had such a nearly universal good outcome with little surgical morbidity or motor findings. It was pretty much a, a done deal as far as what we expected, but it, it really made no difference. And I've become not relaxed, but not as concerned about those that I perceive to be barriers to getting these catheters in a, in a deep seated center like that. And we weren't the first, obviously, to put things in the brainstem from the super uh, supertentorial compartment. This has been done for decades with biopsy uh, and many of my, uh, our colleagues that preceded uh, my time in this. So. Um, but then infusing the, the agent became the, the disparate issue there. So I'm always asked, you know, are you, are you changing the playing field? And, and, and recently at a symposium that Kathy Warren was at, she, she kind of stood up and said, enough is enough. You've been doing this for five years. Have you, have you cured these kids? You know, and that, that's obviously the pointed question. And that's where the mindset now starts to shift is uh, from a technical to a therapeutic uh, interface that I want to talk to you about the detail about. But certainly we're, we're not doing any worse, and I, my suspicion is we're doing far better. When I started my career, there was a median survival of between 9 and 11 months at best. Whatever cooperative group has looked at this, you know, median survival hovers around that, that time point, uh, 10, 11 months. And, and with uh, several survivors still in our phase 1 study, we're, we're just uh, shy of uh, 16 months now with our updated work um, with some uh, really interesting anecdotal results that, that I want to highlight to try and, you know, we scratch our heads and look at and answer uh, why. So certainly we're not doing anything worse, and if anything, uh, there's a suggestion that these kids are doing better. Um, and that's not just borne out by overall survival stats. If you start to now, you know, why in some versus others, can you start to look at some of the variables that might predict who's going to do better or not? You know, one thing we're limited by is that we're not doing the biological correlates that uh, we would love to do. But again, phase one, morbidity, uh, high attention uh, scale on this, uh, certainly not on this, but as we move into looking at clinical responsiveness, I think it's going to be a, a mandate for us to do that. But you start to parse out simple things like dose, you know, age, gender. You know, these are the, the simple low-lying fruit that one could look at. You start to see some disparity, but you know, these are three by three formats, dose escalations, impossible to get any statistical relevance. Uh, but clearly, there's some separation in, in, in individuals. What was most impressive to me is I started again. Usually, we saw these kids at time of diagnosis prior to me getting involved in this clinical trial. We'd lateral them to the oncologist, the radiation oncologist, and seldom would we ever see them again until they called us and asked about hydro or ventricular enlargement. So I never followed these kids through death and looked at serial imaging, to be quite frank with you. But one thing I was impressed about is we saw some of these kids. There is an example at the time of diagnosis in 2015. You know, one thing you got to be very careful about here is mixing and having crossover with other forms of therapy, you get a fairly brilliant response to external beam radiation therapy in most of these kids with a volumetric reduction. Um, so, you know, it, is that an artifact of looking at what we've done versus external beam? But this child treated twice. You can see that that tumor by this time is at least the surrogate of tumor. And I'll be very careful about saying that. It's relatively constrained. There's 10 months of follow up, increasing white matter changes uh, from the standpoint of our infusion. And, and, and we started to see this rarely, but this idea that the it looked like there was some inflammation treatment related issue from the standpoint of extension into the thalamus. You can see there the cerebellum, the cerebellar peduncles, and a kid who essentially looked intact. You know, so is it treatment related? Is it is it some aspect of that, that immunotherapy component of this? It's certainly it's not local radiation therapy issues. Um, and she actually went so far, a radiation oncologist, to uh, treat her with some involved field in the posterior thalami. 
Um, she's still alive today, and that was uh, diagnosed in 2015, but she went through this phase of very unusual features on the MRI scan. But if you look at her brain stem today, it, uh, it is quite remarkable. And this, this idea of uh, local control has is, is started to really insinuate itself in my mind as something that we want to look at, not just overall survival. Now, again, that, that is one of the parameters of uh, response-based therapy here. Um, here's two examples of our, of our best comers to date. I think there's a dose level three. She's just over six years out now. This youngster just passed her three-year mark uh, from diagnosis. If you look at the, the morphology of the brainstem, you can always see a signature that either disease or we were there. There's no question about it. But, but the overall uh, part of the, the kind of the outline of the brainstem doesn't look anything like how it is. In fact, if even if this person were to pass away from their disease, and we are seeing extension outside of the primary field. So a couple anecdotal long-term survivors, local control, uh, and then the overall survival being somewhat better than the norm. And this pretty much mirrors what has been evolving in the supertentorial compartment with my adult colleagues in oncology, and that's how does CED, and one's gotta be very careful, it's a tool, you know, it's not a unified therapeutic approach. As I mentioned before, there are different agents, different targets, different domains. Yeah, but how does it compare to the uh, evolution of this as, a, as an interface for oncology? And this summary that was uh, uh, published uh, just shy of two years ago <clears throat> really looked at this in, uni in a unified fashion. I think there were 14 clinical series that they looked at with regard to direct drug delivery being the interface for a therapeutic uh, idea of treating these, usually the multiply recurrent supernatorial malignant glioma. If you want a, a beast to treat, uh, especially with CED, it's that. You know, we thought the brainstem would make a much more reasonable uh, prototype just because of it's fairly constrained, it's uh, relatively small, et cetera. There's no cavitation, there's no surgical incursion, so the distribution should benefit from that. But nevertheless, that, that summary showed, again, that this is very well tolerated with the right surgical interfaces, the right catheters, right flow rates, uh, volumes and that the systemic toxicity has been negligible to not, regardless whether it's a platin-based uh, therapeutic compound, a radioisotope, uh, conjugated immunotoxins. And all of these, to some degree, look at this idea of partial response. So in the supertentorial compartment with the contrast-enhancing tumor is somewhat easier than, than DIPG, but embedded in all these studies, you will always see one or two patients in their series that, that seem to have responded in a beneficial fashion even though universally, you look at overall survival in these small cohorts, there doesn't seem to be any benefit. Um, so one takes this and uh, says, well, CED doesn't work. And that's certainly the pushback I've got at my institution with some of our esteemed oncologists. But the, the stress that one needs to make here is multifold, and, I, and I'll give you some sense of that. Um, and, I, and I hope this doesn't come across in any way of uh, being biased, but. As I start to critically look at this, because this is, again, you know, do I want to invest this time and this amount of money and this effort to distract from everything else I'm doing uh, to push this forward? You know, And so much of this hinges on things that, as neurosurgeons, we're never trained to think about with scheduling, with those symmetry. Um, but but here's, here's the catch as far as I think from the standpoint of at least DIPG. You know, if you look at the variability of these kids, as best we can estimate on study entry, it's all over the place. And this is just an estimate based on T2 or flare-related sequences, looking at, I call it burden of disease, but that's volumetric assessment of the tumor. So as you're doing this dose escalation, you're assigning them to a certain fixed dose and volume, irrespective of what that, that tumor looks like. Again, the evolving mindset of a phase two or, or clinical study to look at clinical benefit. So it would be very remiss in my optic to say that, are we doing any good or not, without looking at these types of variables. Same thing with dose. You know, it doesn't matter how big the tumor is, if the kid is treated on dose level A or B or C or D, uh, there's, no, there's no marriage there between what they need uh, and what, uh, what we're going to assign them to. Uh, the absorbed dose, uh, if you look at the uh, standard deviation there, absorbed dose is just the, uh, the, the nuclear medicine's calculation as far as of the prescribed dose we give, how much actually gets in our lesion or our area of interest. Uh, and that's reported in different ways with RADS or centigrade. Um, volume of distribution, again, you'd expect this to be very low at the initial stages and quite high as we get into higher and higher volumes. And the list goes on and on. The point is there's a huge amount of variability and metrics that we have not even begun to skim the surface from the standpoint of looking at potential response. So I'll say that 
you know, as we look at the idea of therapeutic planning and kind of laying the groundwork for a, a clinical study to look at clinical benefit, you know, we need to be very, very careful, concerned, integrate these into our planning schemes. And these are just two different examples uh, estimated. And this is not all done by me. You know, we have uh, uh, MR physicists who do a lot of this, some uh, overseas that we've partnered with. But you can look at uh, the, that top panel there and, and see that even on the same dose level, uh, one child with greater than 45 cubic centimeters versus six cubic centimeters of target tissue that we need to. And again, this is so different relative to systemic therapy, right? We give something systemically and it's somewhat irrelevant, right? Because the concentration by and large should be the same in our, in our target tissue. With regional delivery or direct drug delivery, this is so geometrically defined. It would be so crucial about uh, the thought process about drug administration. Uh, and again, you'd expect volume of distribution. That's the, uh, that's the readout of how much drug gets in what domain at certain measured time points. Um, quite variable, but again, quite uh, impressive as we get to the higher doses relative to the, the tumor burden. These are just a couple snapshots of what it looks like from the standpoint of what we're doing at the time of uh, 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 our, our catheter placement and predictive modeling. And this is on a T2 scaled image, so we do our best and our colleagues do our best to outline tumor. Again, we know this is a surrogate. We know this is just macroscopic uh, measurement of, of where tumor is involved. Um, so it doesn't do anything as far as the infiltrated front to some degree. Uh, all of these, by and large, are non-contrast enhancing. This is a T1 representative image. You know, not too bad as far as the correlation if one were to rely on this. Um, then the real horsepower behind our imaging modalities is the integration of the PET. Um, so what, what we've really struggled with is our PET signal, if anybody's ever uh, looked at the readout from PET scans, you, you have a lot of subjective uh, variability in the way you, you create a threshold and look for a signal. And the, the, the radiation, uh, uh, the other nuclear medicine specialists, they do this intentionally because as isotopes decay, they need to gauge for that and correct for that. But nevertheless, you know, the morphologies look dar pretty darn good from the standpoint of overlap and, uh, and overall shape. Uh, and as we try to calculate a threshold in our PET scan, you know, the overlap with our delta T2 or infusion volume seems to be pretty darn good. Another example here, this is pre-infusion, increased T2 signal. And I, I can tell you, these brain stems swell. You get the, the MR on the, on the first day after infusion. And initially, our neuroradiologists were saying, there looks like there's disease progression. But you know, these swell, and they retract within X number of hours. Um, increased T2 signal uh, outlined, uh, there's our volume of distribution overlied with PET. And we look at the, the agreement between those distribu distribution maps. And the beauty with PET is we can get a readout of dose. It's not scaled on the millimeter um, element that we'd like, but nevertheless, we can start to get a readout of dose over tumor and distribution. And that's kind of the target where we're going with this. This is a sample of our last several patients we treated on our, our highest dose level. The, the different dose levels here um, are, are just gauged by escalation of a, of a rate, not so much a, an overall dose or volume. Um, but the, the thing that I'm really starting to hone in on with regard to should I invest you know, time and money uh, and how does it affect outcome uh, in a phase one dose escalation scheme is, is really not looking at what we were doing initially. Here's estimations of tumor volume in cubic centimeters. Uh, this is a distribution as best we can estimate in cubic centimeters. You know, it, there's some agreement. You know, we seem to be doing well sometimes, not so well in others. Uh, but then when really when you start to not just look at here's our volume of distribution, here's our tumor volume, do they agree? <coughs> not just do they agree in volume, but what about in space? You know, are they truly overlapping? If you want to use one extreme, if you inject in one hemisphere of tumors in the other, even though the distribution's good, you wouldn't predict a good outcome. And this is all over the place from the standpoint of coverage. You know, and uh, uh, is this a function of something we can do better? The answer is yes, I know it is, and that comes with uh, certain issues, and that has to do with, uh, again, the, this is kind of a post hoc analysis of our, our, our ugly grayscale image of PET overlied with our distribution and altered T2, then the, the, the comparison, and that's how we try and gain some appreciation of overlap, and then the overlap then has to be a uh, multiplied to some degree by the, the administered dose, and that's what we're looking at with the dose response assessment. I can tell you that it's, it becomes really problematic as you start to hone in on any of these because all of these are insufficient to some degree, and they're, they're surrogates. This is an example of pre and post infusion. 
with an increase in T2 signal, uh, swollen brain stem after infusion, and that's what we currently use. We did this intentionally, we didn't co-infuse gadolinium, much to my uh, colleagues around the world who say you should, should have been, um, but again, phase one study, I didn't want to risk this in any way, shape, or form. Um, and uh, this is great work that uh, John Sampson's been doing at Duke with regard to, again, looking at MR correlates of infusing, and he used a, uh, an albumin labeled with I-123 to even compound or, or look at a comparison like we're doing with your altered T2 signal versus your, in this particular case, spec scan. Um, really, really good agreement in, in their series like we're seeing, um, providing there wasn't a lot of T2 signal change before treatment. And you start to lose some ability uh, with regard to the, the uh, fidelity of this as you start to increase your T2 signal before administration. And then really kind of the, uh, I won't say the gold standard, but the push by most is to co-infuse a radio-opaque agent, whether it be MR or CT at the time of drug administration, to define where your agent is going. And I'm going to uh, kind of expand upon that in a moment. It makes great conceptual sense from the immediate drug delivery component. Is this sitting into the subarachnoid space? Is it getting into the ventricle? Is it kind of egressing around the catheter tract? Those are important issues um, that we're honing in on with our PET scan. But you know, gadolinium is a really, really good uh, contrast agent from the standpoint of looking at distribution issues. Um, however, I'm going to raise a couple of issues, and that is uh, we've had the opportunity with some pilot studies looking at different therapeutic approaches. This is an oncolytic virus, and, and these two scales here are the volume of distribution, the blue scale, the volume of distribution based on gadolinium image, and these are uh, hours post-infusion down here. And really by day, you know, we have no idea. By hours, we have little idea where our drug is. The gadolinium uh, pretty much uh, washes away pretty quickly from the interstitium. Um, so while it may be good at time zero, I can tell you it's non-existent at 6, 12, 24 hours. And from the therapeutic planning standpoint, you know, how do we integrate that into a schedule that's otherwise undefined? Do we do this every six hours? Do we do it every two weeks? Do we do it you know, once a month? Impossible to know without having that type of readout. And the other comparison is here an example of one of our patients treated with uh, the monoclonal antibody, the radioisotope. This is at time zero, and again, these are scaled and threshold to account for and, and uh, correct for decay. But here's eight days. We're using a targeted molecule, whether this be naked isotope or antibody conjugate. You know, we're still seeing pretty robust signal insofar as we can tell with an isotope that came with a half-life of about just over four days with a, a half-life. You know, versus what we're seeing with gadolinium. So if we're going to start to use <coughs> some mechanism to talk about frequency and, and an effective therapeutic plan, this by and large has to be built into the thought process here. Um, another example that we're working with with some of our uh, chemists who are labeling appealing agents and agents that we want to think about integrating into this platform, and this is a, uh, a radio-labeled uh, uh, panabinostat, which is an HDAC inhibitor, pan-HDAC inhibitor. Here's gadolinium. Here's our molecule here. So as you start to get beyond several hours, certainly minutes, certainly days, there's a disparity in the capacity. One, to visualize. Two is the, the distribution patterns are clearly different. So this idea that we can give gadolinium and know with confidence where a drug is is really a fallacy. It's okay for, like I said, the mechanics of administration, but beyond that, we're at a loss. Um, what do you do about, you know, no oncologist, they, they, they'd be yawning, walking out of the room, you're gonna get a single dose and then you're gonna cure DIPG, you know, this is silly. It is silly on some level. But again, we don't know. We've never done this from the standpoint of direct administration, targeted agent. Uh, we're talking about radiation. That's the only thing that we've ever seen any radiographic response in these kids. Uh, and then the uh, uh, immune regulation thing that I, that I spoke about with checkpoint inhibition. So we've gone so far as to retreat some of these kids, bilateral administrations, certainly the group in Bristol and now in, in the UK that is using you know, four catheters in the brainstem. I haven't felt the need to do that yet. We're seeing amazing distribution patterns with a single catheter. Uh, time will tell, but there are platforms that are available today to put one, two, three, four catheters in your area of interest and repeatedly go back to a transcutaneous port. Jeff Bruce at Columbia is now treating his supertentorial gliomas with the uh, Topra T can with an infusion pump, the ITB pump. So the, the idea that you know, this is not going to be a one time deal is true, but again, as one, as one moves forward in the idea of acceptance, like I said, one needs to be very cautionary about the direction one goes.
The other criticism I hear all the time is, yeah, but these diseases aren't constrained. You might talk about these being brainstem tumors, but if you look at what has evolved and you see enough of these tumors, you disseminate a disease. One of the reasons we chose this versus a medulloblastoma is just because it was something that we don't think about in the same breath as being highly metastatic. But at time of death, the disease recurrence, you see this with some regularity. Um, but again, I'll say for the last 60 years, we treated this as a localized process with involved field radiation therapy. So the critique has to be taken in stride. And if we can demonstrate in any way regional control, then we move into the realms that we've used with other cancers and certainly CNS tumors in kids with CNS prophylaxis or IT administration of the same isotope. You know, the, 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 the capacity here is large. And, and anybody who would have treated medulode X number of years ago with involved field radiation therapy and then watch late failure, they didn't give up. They basically said, now we have to supplement it. And the same is true with uh, some of the bloodborne diseases in kids. You know, the other real difficult thing here is, you know, do we wait for the child to die to gain some appreciation as to whether or not we're doing any good? I think the short answer is no. You know, and again, there's convergence of where we are and you know, technological driven uh, advances and assays is, is very exciting. You know, it kind of starts to go into this whole realm of phase zero studies and can I start to look at a response based on a single patient rather than cohorts of three, five, ten, you know, et cetera, et cetera. These take a decade to get that kind of information once you reach a, a phase two study. But what we're really interested in is some of these other elements. This is an example of a child pre and post infusion. Uh, and this is some great work that was done looking at a longitudinal volumetric assessment of the brain stem, so it has a surrogate. In some respects, it's less operator dependent. You just use the peel outline of the pond in a longitudinal manner uh, in DIPG. This was uh, this is just conventional external brain radiation therapy. But you can see at time of uh, diagnosis, you get this big dip after radiation therapy, which is expected progression. And, the, and these authors actually went so far to say that volumetric assessment is not representative because their MR spectroscopy didn't agree. Uh, I can tell you that I have been very unimpressed with MR spectroscopy and this disease as a predictor of biological activity. So we're going to continue to follow this format and look at volumetric longitudinal assessment. If my hypothesis, or I shouldn't say my hypothesis, but if we see clinical benefit, we should see, rather than at this uh, upward inflection after time of treatment, we should see some decrement if my idea about this local control is real. So we should be able to change this morphology in a, on a longitudinal manner. We did look and we are continuing to look at multivoxel MR spectroscopy and the beauty here is not so much, I think the read up from, it, from spectroscopy I've been very underwhelmed in my opinion, uh, but nevertheless we can look at this in a dose response manner. So we have our overlay of our PET scan to give us some idea of you know, what dose seems to be working where. Uh, and that's pretty good spatial resolution and that's another approach we've been using. You know, then I think the other engaging platform is going to be what's coming out in the uh, uh, world of more uh, metabolic uh, assessments. Um, our, our metabolic imaging, we partnered with a group at Memorial who have uh, used a PARP inhibitor labeled with an isotope as a therapeutic molecule. We have also find it, it it's to, at least in our animal models, beautifully in malignant gliomas and DIPGs in particular. So can you use a molecular readout as volume or disease burden rather than uh, anatomical issues. And that's a path we're going down to see if we can look at another metric that's much more immediate rather than uh, overall survival. And we could do that in a time scale measured in days. Um, the other is a liquid biopsy. I think we are there. Uh, we've uh, published our results recently from Memorial on, on malignant gliomas as a longitudinal <laughs> assessment. Yeah, but I, I think we are there in these interesting therapeutic or innovative design trials uh, to be proposing that we're putting in omayas or, or catheters in the lumbar cistern or, or actually doing LPs every time they come in for an MR. Mm -hmm. That's how valuable this information could be if it's validated in a longitudinal manner. Uh, and that's something we're proposing right now in our next phase of studies is that we don't just put in our therapeutic molecule at some frequency and expect the best, but we want to follow this longitudinally based on uh, our, our administration of the therapeutic molecule regardless of what it is. Um, the other heavy investment here, you know, can you change the idea of what our big pharmaceutical companies think? You know, it's pretty rare they come to you with a biological or targeted therapeutic molecule and say, oh, by the way, we've, we've labeled it with some MR or PET uh, a, a contrast agent or a readout that, that can give you some idea of dose symmetry is, is pretty much non-existent. So partnering with pharmacy, partnering, pharmaceutical companies, partnering with uh, some of our chemists, 
to actually start taking an array of agents that we think have capacity and then look at the retained biological activity to look at distribution maps, frequency, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of complexity. You know, what isotope are you using? How long can you image it? Do you want to do this in a, in, in, a, in a way that you're looking at something that's uh, transferable and translatable in the clinical realm versus uh, something you just need to uh, document in a preclinical realm? But th this is what I think is, I, 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 I hesitate to say criminal, but I'll say it, that you know, all these open clinical trials for the direct drug delivery of a variety of agents, you know, none of these are looking at the kinetics of what's happening after administration. So we put in our agent, let's hope we've cured multiply recurring GBM. That chance, I think. And so we've got to be very clever from the neurosurgical standpoint about being careful as well, by jumping into this idea that you know the hurrah thing, hey, we can do it, so let's do it. But think about it more in an oncologic way. I would say put your mind in the, the realm of a radiation oncologist. It'd be analogous to putting a kid in a linear accelerator or a, a gamma knife and pushing a button with no dose symmetry, no isodose lines, no negative dose planning. And, that we're going to give one dose and hope we've done something. It's, it's, it's really, really short-sighted. Uh, a couple more comments, and that is, uh, um, you know, so if I could design, and now at this fulcrum that, that, that I'm at in my career and the work we're doing, you know, I think we're pretty darn close to saying we've done plenty of safety information. <coughs> now we want to tailor make this for each child at time of presentation. We, we've gone up to a volume that we think we can encompass most tumors. So predictably say, this is the volume of tumor, this is our target, and we use MR tractography, which we know influences, and we're trying to validate our predictive modeling right now with the group in Munich at Brain Lab, and to say, does this work in the brainstem like it does in the putamen as far as predictive modeling? And then we want to reach a therapeutic concentration of a drug in a defined area. That, that is so crucial from the standpoint of where I think this should go and where we should be. And then how often do we redose? How are we going to monitor this? Is it microdialysis? Is it putting something back in the brainstem? Is it tissue sampling? Is it liquid biopsy? This is where the really elegant uh, element of this design could go, and I would implore anybody going into this room that it should go. So I'm going to say a couple last words to the residents. I think I have uh, six minutes. Um, you know, advice to you as you move forward. <laughs> you know, don't be deterred. You know, these are very difficult. You know, Rich was talking in a very nice and probably artificial way of you know, the work I've done in endoscopy. Um, this is far different. You know, it's not picking up a tool in the operating room and say, let's do six kids or 60 individuals and see how they do. I mean, this is from the ground up, and, and this is taking a lot of criticism from the standpoint of feasibility and cost. And, and this is just an example. And this was back in 2009, and the formats changed at Memorial. Uh, but I mentioned from the time of protocol submission uh, to it going to the FDA, it was somewhere under about 13, 14 months with a lot. You're going to put these kids to sleep? You're going to give them an anesthetic? You're going to stick something in their brainstem? I mean, it's just, yeah, it, it's hard. It's really hard. And then pile on top of that, and I didn't know this before I could go through final, uh, uh, at least IRB approval, where are you going to get the $2 million, by the way? I didn't think of that. <laughs> and so problematic. You know, and you go back to the drawing board and you, and you solicit in any way you, you can. And then after things were approved and ready to go, then the institution came back and said, well, you've never worked like this in an MR environment. You know, we have to create an MR safety committee and it has to go through another. I was ready to quit and say, this, this is ridiculous. You know, I'd much rather do shunt revisions, <laughs> which, which is still true. Um, and then the other message to the residents is, first of you know, don't, again, be deterred by what's in front of you. And, uh, who knows where this will go, and I'll probably regret doing any of this, but uh, these are cost estimates for inception of phase one, two, and three clinical trials, and this is in millions of dollars down here. Um, you know, the, the blue over here to the far left, you know, two to three million dollars can usually get you through a phase one study pretty effectively, regardless of the disease process. But if you look at oncology up here, it's, you know, third most expensive. As soon as you move into the realm of a phase two or three study, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars to, to generate this type of data you need to move it forward. And this is the probability or what's called likelihood of success that from the time of inception, it actually gets approved for a therapeutic uh, study by the, not study, but the acceptable form of uh, treatment. And oncology, I think it's, yeah, it's here in green on the bottom, you know, single digit percentages that I don't know, there's certainly shy of 100 people here that you know, two to three ideas maybe out of 100 will get to the point where it's actually 
approved a move forward in a therapeutic way. The other, I remember when Caitlin and her mother, uh, this Caitlin, uh, not my wife, um, came up from Florida as the first patient we put on study. I can tell you, work in the lab with David Sandberg and Neil Luther and whomever, you know, it's fun, it's engaging, you get some publications. When mom comes in or dad comes in to sign the consent, you know, I can tell you there's a lot of introspection. Did I do everything I should to prove this is safe? Hasn't been done. You know, it's, it's not about me, but it's you know, about these people here. So have you done your due diligence and are you responsible in your, in your lab work and your translational efforts the way you should? A lot of us are so excited about get something through and get a publication, but I tell you, you got a bigger responsibility from the standpoint of where this goes. Um, something that Vivian Tabar, my chairman at Memorial, referred to me uh, a couple of years ago, not because I was unethical, I think, but uh, <laughs> just because she heard about some of these challenges that were in front of us. If you haven't read this, this is pretty impressive. It's not anything you don't know, but it, it really spills it out in black and white in front of you as far as anybody in, in clinical or biomedical research. And you can read through these, but I'll tell you that as you start to go to the next step of, hey, we're going to publish our results on a couple long-term survivors in DIPG, and, and trust me, there's been a lot of push for me to do this, but uh, you know, I'm going to be my hardest critic. You know, I don't want this to be gauged in an artificial way. I don't care to invest X more years or decades in that kind of money on something that, that might not be, at least in my opinion, uh, that is credible. So this is hard. You've got to really dig down deep and be methodical about what you choose or not to choose uh, to, to publish. And the, the other thing, I think it's the last slide with regard to uh, um, and my advice to the residents. Everybody was talking about, you know, how do you balance it? The answer is you don't. It's absolutely an impossibility. So you know, this is not my whole career, but this longitudinal uh, kind of review, and I talked about this long process of doing this. And if you put on the other side of that, everything else you're supposed to be doing in life, um, you know, th this becomes an impossibility. You know, so when everybody says, you how to balance it, I don't balance it. But I will stress to you that uh, these shouldn't be on the bottom part of this line. You know, these, these require attention. It's very easy to get distracted, fly all over the world, and get things published and apply for grants, but boy oh boy do we get our work cut out for us in, in a field like we all adore and love. And, and the reason, and part of the reason it works is you know, these types of interfaces. You know, in this short term time that uh, we've had this interface between Seattle and New York, um, you know, it makes it enjoyable. You know? And uh, you know, Rich and I, last night when we were talking, it wasn't about CED, and it wasn't about endoscopy, it was about raising kids and school and education and the, the, the struggles that we all go through. Um, and that's the essence of, of, of really the friends we make. This is Peter teaching my kid how to declaw and take meat out of a lobster claw. So with that, I will close. Um, and any questions that you have, I'll try and address <laughs> while, you, while you watch another form of here. And, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan, for the entire